Welcome to the Smack Happy Design Video Cast, where we explore all things web and marketing. With your hosts, Nicole and Danielle. Hi, welcome to episode number 14. I'm Nicole. And I'm Danielle. And I just want to remind our audience that we'll be taking some notes for you. So you can just sit back, relax, and listen. And you can download the notes at smackhappy.com slash videos. Today, our guest is Leo Manzione, who is a coach and coaching coordinator, as well as director of marketing for RunRight Consulting. And he lives to help people succeed. Welcome, Leo. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little more about yourself. So my whole life has been about helping small businesses. It's just been a passion and frankly, an obsession of mine for decades now. It's everything from helping a small business owner really think through the obstacles that feel overwhelming to getting them the tools to overcoming those, which we'll talk a little bit more about today and just helping them celebrate that success, which frankly should be a lot more common than it is. Too many small business owners don't get what they need. So this is something I'll be doing for as long as I possibly can. And I love every minute of it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today uh, we're going to talk about the 80-20 rule and how it applies to being a business owner. So um, where do you see this showing up, Leo? Tell us all about what this means for business owners. Great question. So the simple answer is everywhere. I mean, this is a paradigm that we use for decision making, um, either by default or ideally by design, that just encompasses everything. Because as a decision owner, I mean, our day to day and our success is clearly defined by how well we make the decisions that confront us. So what we're gonna talk about as we explain this is just it's a way of looking at the inputs versus the outputs and realizing that it's not a direct correlation. And because of that, it opens up an opportunity to reinvest our time and money to have a much greater output. But there are some snags along the way, which we'll touch on some more that really trip people up and make this a lot harder than it needs to be. So um, what, what are some of, some of these things that you see popping up? Absolutely. So one of the most common ones is in marketing and there's, there's two parts to it. There's getting clients and there's the clients that you're trying to get in the first place, because it, going backwards, the right clients are those that really appreciate everything that you do. They like the way you do business. They like the exact services that you provide and there's a high return on investment for what you do for them. So it's a big win win. Um, a lot of people will chase the wrong kinds of customers. Those for whom what I just described isn't true. And it's not a win-win and it's tough to build a business on that kind of a platform. The other part are the activities that are used to get these clients into the business. Because like I said, if it's a win-win, the sales process becomes really simple, but those activities are also very different in their returns. Um, a lot of people will think that, Oh, you know, this marketing activity is absolutely essential. Uh, but frankly, when you really look at the numbers, it's not. And if you reinvested the time and money, use to get clients that way, you'd see there are other activities you could really use to a much greater effect. So it's using the right strategies to get the right clients and marketing, and then also knowing exactly who to go after. That's one of the first things that people really need to focus on. And it's easy to make assumptions that could really tear a business apart or really limit its growth. Mm -hmm. So for marketing, what, what is the 80 and what's the 20? So it depends. It, it really depends. Um, but this is actually a good chance for us to dig deep into the exercise so people can kind of answer that themselves. Um, the core concept here, and if you look at the slide, you'll see expectations versus reality. You'll see that it's not always direct. The five inputs don't always result in just one fifth of the output. It can be as dramatic as, as you see, one of them resulting in as much as 80% of what's coming out. So first step is to really clearly define the distinction between what you're putting in and what you get out. Um, not to get too granular, um, but you need to distinguish between time and money uh, because time is the resource that you're, you're never going to get more of, but money, if you can create a reinforcing loop, which we'll touch on later, 
that's exactly what you want. It doesn't matter if you're spending $20,000 to get a client because if it's a forty or $50,000 client, you can have that loop repeat itself and scale up. Um, so to answer that question yourselves, I wish I had a simpler answer. It's to really distinguish between what you're putting in and what you're trying to get out, like we touched on earlier. Who is that ideal client? And you figure that out by talking to your clients and looking back and saying, who did I enjoy working with most? Who was the biggest raving fan? And how can I find other people like that? And that conversation usually starts with that person because like attracts like, and they know other people like them and they know how to help you find other people just like them. And then once you look at those strategies, you can reevaluate and invest in what's going to help those people come to your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got, um, we, we refer to that as a buyer persona when you're figuring out who your best client is. And um, we've got a great resource we can attach to this that kind of helps you define who that is. I think it's something too that um, so many people still struggle with, uh, you know, looking at, um, oh, I need to, looking at the strategy more like, oh, I need to get as many as I can to make much as much as I can, you know, I need to get so many clients when that's like sort of like the older idea of doing things and how things have evolved and you know where it's it's very this is a, this is a very human and more human way to me to to make sense of being successful so you're getting to know uh you're getting to know people and you're getting to know um the people that you want coming back to you and um it just makes a lot more sense and i and i hope that as time goes along, um, I think in so many ways, in different podcasts and materials that we've handed out there, we say this all the time. But you know, it's definitely one of those things that 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 I hope people are more open to in terms of like the the strategy of getting the better clients and of being more successful in their business is, yeah. Fingers crossed. I mean, you guys have been a great example of that for us. I mean, the website that you helped us create, I mean, that you created for us, I mean, it's helped us find perfect clients because they get to see a scalable version of our message online. And that's something that today's day and age is normal. But when you really compare that to previous marketing avenues, it's just unheard of. I mean, imagine telling a business owner 50 years ago, oh, you can put a message out there that'll reach anybody in the world that has access to this thing called the internet. Um, it's mind boggling. <laughs> So that's yeah. a great example of how as time progresses, the inputs available to us change. And that's why uh, the evolution and adaptation of small businesses is critical. I mean, there's a business owner I was meeting up with just the other day that missed that bus. And it, it's really tough to see because his competitors have the market and he just gets what's available to him. To, um, to touch on something that you said, Danielle, as well, what you described of people that take just the business that's available to them. I mean, it, it's a state of desperation, which is not only sad to see because it's, it's not a good place to be, but the opportunity cost is high. That's somebody that you look at the situation on the right, those bottom four uh, on the inputs. So the, the four 20% that result in just one 20% of the output. So just a fifth of the output. That's a tough place to be because the inputs also include stress. Um, and the thing is, is having a client portfolio that just gives you stress instead of really making your time worthwhile, that's a tough place to be. But the yeah. big thing that we do and the, the problem out there where people struggle is distinguishing between the two. Because frankly, people do bad science. They, they assume that a certain input ties to a certain output and usually the data doesn't suggest that. So it's yeah. tough to take a step back and really look at those numbers. But key. Mm -hmm. So do you have any tips on like how, how to do that, how to look at it? Absolutely. Um, there's so many. So we talked about marketing. Marketing is one of five parts of every business. Um, and the thing is every business is bottlenecked in one major way. And the, the funny thing about bottlenecks is as soon as you fix one, another one shows up somewhere else. So it's like I was saying earlier, it's tough to take a look at your business and see what's limiting it. That's why I really recommend talking to an expert that can help you because one common phenomenon is if somebody misdiagnoses the bottleneck, for example, let's say somebody hires you 
and you as you do create an amazing website that floods their business with leads if they were going after the wrong clientele so people that like i was saying earlier just aren't the right fit it's not a high roi it's not a good use of their time it's not a win-win that hurts the business ironically and it's ironic because you did a phenomenal job but it's because the wrong limitation was focused on sure they need more leads but first and foremost they needed to focus on the first part which is value creation which is making sure you have something your target market wants and is willing to pay for so that's one of many things. I mean, I'll, I'll list off a couple and sometimes this will resonate with people because I really do believe that people have a, a deep down idea, even if it's not clearly defined as to what is limiting their success. But the first one, like I said, is, is commonly not having something that really resonates with your target market. It's easy to create something in isolation. The other one, which is most commonly thought to be the bottleneck is I'm just not meeting enough people. Uh, but often that's, that's not the problem they really have. The third going along with sales is some people have a really bad closing ratio. Um, and that either ties into talking to unqualified people or really just not having uh, the proper sales script and process set up. Value delivery is the fourth part. I mean, a lot of people don't have a process that really is a reinforcing loop, like we'll touch on in a minute, that reinvigorates the business with cash and allows it to improve what it's doing. Um, and also create raving fans consistently. Lawyers, we work with a lot of attorneys and a lot of attorneys are limited at a very specific point. I mean, any service business, frankly, at this point where they hit the ceiling where the service professional that started the business can't do any more work. Um, they usually get burnt out, quality tends to drop and that's a big problem. So a big victory to be won, frankly, before it's necessary is figuring out how to scale. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, I won't get into them now. And the last part, like I said, is finance. Um, one of the big problems that people face, and again, these are just bottlenecks in case they resonate with people and it leads to further analysis, is just mismanaging money. Um, one of the first ways that we need to increase profit is by looking at expenses. Um, and a lot of people will be spending money on things that they assume are required. So they essentially treat it as a fixed cost when in reality, everything in the long term is the variable cost. It's, sorry, it's getting a little nerdy with accounting. Um, but they just assume that it's taking necessary. me back. And frankly, if they were to take that, yeah. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, if they were to take that money out and put it elsewhere, it could really transform the business. It really, really could. So I know that was a really long answer, but I hope that answers your question, Nicole. That was a great answer. Yeah. No. Yeah, so you keep mentioning the reinforcing loop. I think my curiosity is taking the best of me. You're going to have to tell us about that now. <laughs> <laughs> is it time? Well, Are you ready? Extract. <laughs> yes, we'll do it. But the price will be a, a bad pun. You were talking about podcasts earlier, Danielle. Yeah. Um, Wilfredo Pareto, I recommend everybody listening to this. He's the economist that came up with this. Uh, he's a fascinating gentleman. But he, before the days of podcast, did pod studies. And what he noticed was the pea pods that he was growing, a minority of them are producing the majority of peas. So imagine a pea pod that's mostly pod, not enough peas, and then other ones that are really like the ones we have today, brimming with pea pods. That's the, the foundation of all of this. So I recommend checking them out. And it's just a really awesome phenomenon because this is not new. This is old. This has been around for a long time. And I think in today's day and age, like we touched on earlier, it's more applicable than ever. But the reinforcing loop, uh, Nicole, to touch on that is, uh, for example, the best kind of marketing is a coin operated marketing system where you essentially put in money and you get a customer out. The customer gives you more because of the services you render than that coin you put in. And then you have more coins to put in. And then you put in two and you get two customers, it makes four and it multiplies up. I mean, that's how the Giants uh, back in the day, not, not the baseball team, but the, the Giants in business became so huge. Uh, using TV advertising, for example, um, you could turn a dollar into four dollars and then that four into 16 and within some time it's an exponential growth cycle. Um, one thing I want to add is with the reinforcing loop like this, one of the risks is that a business can grow out of control. We always talk about the five parts of every business because they need to grow in tandem. Um, if one outgrows the others, like the example I said earlier of suddenly being overwhelmed with leads 
um, the rest of the business sometimes just doesn't have enough time to catch up and it has to close. Um, and that often manifests itself as a, just a cash crunch or a time crunch, which means that the business is really having an issue and you need somebody to come in there and fix it, which is a conversation I'm always happy to have because those businesses should get what they need. Um, but this is the reinforcing loop. Um, and this is one of the reasons that the Pareto principle is so powerful because it, it not only ties the action to the effect, so then we see what actions are we going to take more moving forward, but by looking at the results, we can take more action and thus increase more effect. So it's something that's deceptively simple, and frankly, it, it's so much simpler than people think, but the application thereof can get really complex, and that's where it really gets fun and interesting. Does that satisfy your curiosity a bit, Nicole? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Something interesting about what you said what some is that. Reinforcing? Oh, please. Sorry, we. I think we have a little delay. Actually, no, go ahead. Okay. No. Uh, so what? What yeah. interesting thing about what you said um, that I was thinking about was you gave the example of um, you know a business all of a sudden having too many leads and then they don't that you know, it just doesn't work out because they weren't prepared for that or whatever. And on one side of things you would think, well, wow, that's probably like a great problem to have, but how you put, how, how you formed that thought and put that situation into reality, it, it makes it known that that's not necessarily true. And um, I think that's something that some people struggle with is that, you know, and, and I mentioned this earlier, but I know that there are people out there right now that are going to say, well, that's just simply just crazy. You could never have too many leads, you know, but um, I think it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And it definitely reinforces the whole like action and effect and the loop of everything and how you should be thinking about it versus, um, you know, planning, you know, planning and strategy and everything. I mean, getting together with a professional like you and, and talking things out to make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen or it happens the, the best way that it can or the right way. I don't want to say the right way because I don't know if there's a right or wrong to anything in general, but you know what I mean? So um, many ways to do things. <laughs> yeah. There's so many ways, but, um, yeah, so I was just saying that's an interesting point that you brought up and, and I, a different way of looking at it that I think people will need to, should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely want to be prepared. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, your work is another great example of that. I mean, even let's say you created a website for somebody where their business was buy something for $2 that I can deliver immediately, a PDF, for example. That's about as scalable as it gets. I mean, they could sell a million copies and it wouldn't take any more time of theirs. But if you have a million people show up at a website, that's not ready to handle that. I mean, you don't immediately create a website with the capacity to handle that kind of traffic. I don't know what the current standards are, but that's one way that even a business that's about as scalable as you'd think could still struggle with too many leads. Um, so there's always room to improve. And that's one of the things that to me is just so endlessly fascinating in business because even the best, most streamlined, successful businesses have room to get better. Mm -hmm. um, and that also creates a lot of hope for everybody else, the people that don't feel like they're those qualifications yeah. and they can improve. Another touch point um, on something you said that's really key is that the 80-20 rule, it's, it's, there are two things about it. One gets really confusing, which I actually won't touch on. Um, the other is that it's not always 80-20. It can be 50, not 50-50, not but it can be like 60-40. Um, and the thing is, even with that kind of a distinction, you can reinvest and, and increase the output. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit more here. Um, but I'm curious to hear from you too, when it comes to the businesses that you've seen, the businesses that you've worked with, and specifically with web design, what are some reinforcing loops um, that you've seen that are really useful and that people should keep in mind? Um, well, I think, simply speaking, <clears throat> Um, a lot of people maybe don't think it's worthwhile to invest in their website or their online presence. And mm -hmm. I think that this is a mind shift that has to happen. Um, we have this one client that's a perfect example of this Verducci event productions. Um, 
you know, they, they invested a decent amount into their website. And within the first two to three months after they launched, they made all of it back because they had so many more leads. They were getting much better clients. They were going after a new audience that was, you know, bigger and better for their business. So I think it, it kind of falls into line with that. You know, like if you, if you invest in, you know, making yourself look amazing online, like, you know, make sure that it's showing your personality, your professionalism and like carrying through this, the brand message. Like, for example, you look really sharp today. You've got, you know, blue suit, blue tie, blue shirt, and like you match the brand. Like you are a walking version of the brand, right? So it, it carries through everywhere with you. And I think um, that's probably the first thing that pops to my mind. I don't know if you have anything to add, Danielle, or maybe a different aspect. That's such a good example. No, I think that was actually the example I was thinking of because, um, and, and even more to take that example even further, um, I think that, so how we at Smack Happy have positioned ourselves to try to get the clients that we really want and uh, I guess, you know, keep it very like a symbiotic relationship for everybody. I think that we've learned from Verducci and they've learned from us and there's also that relationship to it, the aspect to it as well, like where, you know, we're continuing to help each other grow in a lot of ways, you know, I, I know that they are pretty sure that, I mean, if they, if they were to recommend a web design company, they're going to recommend us now, you know, and they have very concrete reasons why, um, why they would do that because their situation really worked out. And for whatever, you know, however much work we've put into it, um, I think the main point of it all is that there's so many more pieces to just, you know, okay, we gave them this and then this happened. There's this whole other aspect to it too, where it keeps on giving back to you and it keeps on helping people grow and um, it makes people feel good. I mean, even the small wins, the small wins are even better when you're yeah. having this success and it makes it, I don't know, just a really cool experience. That's my chance. Just to add on to that example. And I also want to add real quick, like, I'm not saying you have to hire a big firm like us, but yeah. even if, if like if you're, if you're a small business and you, you know, don't have a ton of funding for this, even if you invest like the time and take, you know, a couple hours every Friday and just, you know, make progress towards it, it you're going to get something out of it. Yeah. And, and there's definitely those people out there and businesses out there that don't have like a ton of budget and, you know, they're trying to navigate this whole thing themselves and figure it out. But, you know, we've said this a lot of times. I know I've said this a bunch of times before, but the first step I really feel like is just talking about it. And, you know, there are professionals out there, you know, us being a few of them, I think that are just willing to just talk to people and try to put them on the right path and, you know, guide them on their, on their path, you know, to try to help them be more successful. I know that I care about what I do. You guys care about what you do and that really shows. So I think that at the very least, if you don't like, don't even think about it as like, Oh, I need a budget or whatever. First, I, to me, I feel like just having that conversation, you start to open up the ideas and, and you get creative and you get thinking and, and then it really starts to be inspiring and it kind of just, takes itself you know from there mm -hmm. sorry i'm getting passionate over here <laughs> i'm starting to talk with my hands no, i don't why we're to talking. do that <laughs> uh, turn this around on us we're supposed to be interviewing you um so tell us about oh, no, this is this is all of us <laughs> about the slide that we're looking at like the many trivial tasks versus like a few vital tasks um gladly well it ties in really well to what you two were just talking about um, you were saying, Nicole? I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. Mm -hmm, I was done. Oh. <laughs> um, so, if, for example, let's say this is somebody's marketing budget and they spend a lot of money on other activities. I won't list them because I don't want to disparage anything in particular. But setting up a basic website is something that they just haven't done. So they might think, you know what, I'm saving money. Or another way that people frame it is saying, I just don't have enough money 
um, to, to set up a professional looking website. So it's something I'll wait until later. But let's just imagine that the few vital tasks, one of those was setting up a website. Let's say that was the task. So if you were to commit 20% of the overall budget, 20% you're saving before, to creating a professional website, and we'll talk about a little bit more and YouTube can speak to it in much better terms, um, that would result in what was previously just 20% of the outputs would have added an extra 80%. So you would add four times as much to so essentially have five times the output by having that professional website. That's a great example because online, it is so easy to make an impression. I mean, today's day and age, I mean, in our pockets, we have access to just about the entire business world. It's incredible. I mean, everything from a Google uh, review page to their website to other review pages like Yelp to their, their Facebook and their LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, social media, the content they're putting out there, the videos, everything, it's available so quickly. When before it would have required you to go to the business or to interact with somebody from the business, either by phone or in person, what have you. So having a good online platform is a phenomenal example because it's a great example of scalable marketing. Um, like Unlike we said earlier, I mean, you can have a million people as long as your website can actually hold those people um, check out your website right here and now um, getting that kind of exposure is something I think a lot of people take for granted and underappreciate uh, so yeah mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic example um, to continue explaining this as well another thing you talked about earlier Danielle are the wins um, one of the nice things about wins is the, one of the limited resources we talked about earlier and, and keep in mind on the side here of, of the resources going in, this could be all resources. And we mentioned one earlier, stress. Um, and you can look at your energy as a business owner and looking at those wins that you have gives you more energy to reinvest because it's exciting. Just like you became excited earlier talking about this because it's invigorating. It's something you're passionate about. And the more you do it, the more you have to invest in what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. So it allows you not only to just figure out what are the best inputs, but also just put in more. Because a key distinction here, and, and I'll finally answer your question in just a minute, Nicole, is, is experimenting. Because that other side, the, the right side of this, of the results, isn't obvious. It's really difficult to distinguish. And, and counterintuitively, when it seems obvious, that's usually because it's wrong. Uh, people will just make gross assumptions about what their actions are actually resulting in. And because of that, make bad decisions um, and that's sad and, and like you said earlier it's not there's that there's really a right or wrong way but there's always a better way mm -hmm. um, which is something that should be really really encouraging but to just explain the slide just simply is just take a look at what you're putting into your business and your end goals and like i said earlier you need to clearly define what's the result that you're going after uh, it changes over time in the beginning it's usually money to hit sufficiency after sufficiency it's making sure that sufficiency is almost permanent. And then after that, the result often becomes more intangible things like time with family and loved ones. But you look at what you're putting in to the system that's often a small business or a job. And by evaluating that with people that have both the experience and the tools necessary to distinguish, you can then figure out what's the best use of your time. One of them being, like we said earlier, investing in a good website. So figuring out what those are lets you then do what we're talking about here, which is cut out um, the trivial tasks. And keep in mind, it, it might seem dangerous to people to say, you know what, I can't afford to lose 20% of the results. Um, and this also requires that you've actually defined um, what results in only 20%. Because if you accidentally cut out some of the vital tasks, it would be a lot more than 20% lost. But then what you can do is reinvest. Because if you were to reinvest in just the vital tasks, you're then multiplying your outputs by 400%. And the thing is, is they're often correlated. Uh, it's not just more money. It's often like we talked about earlier, and like you said, your website helped somebody do. It's also getting the best kind of clients, which means people that you enjoy working with, people that invigorate you, that are raving fans that help you get other clients like them, and that really just make work fun. Yeah. Uh, so like I said earlier, it's, it's distinguishing between that correlation and then acting accordingly on it. Yeah, I like that. It, it's like a, a catch-22 in a positive way, <laughs> just making your life better all around. 
But I feel like we've experienced this, like, mm -hmm. full circle over the last, like, couple of, I mean, ever since I started working with you, um, you know, we've really refined certain things and, you know, considered our processes and things that we do and how we do them. And, um, gosh, some of the clients that I work with, I mean, just from personal experience now, I just, like, I wish that they could be, like, my neighbor or my aunt and, or something like they're all just so fun and um it's fun working on their projects and and you know some people it's not even a website you know it's just different you know marketing things but um it's so much more fun and so much more of a relief to come to work and know that it's going to be that way and it really really feels good and I think it translates into every other piece of our our lives I mean you know if you enjoy what you do while you're working I mean the rest just you know is nice and flows so easy I mean I make it sound like it's cake sometimes it's a little hard but <laughs> we get through it because it's fun yeah I do yeah and that makes the hard work worth it that, mm -hmm. that adds meaning and it's a dramatic word, but it adds meaning to the suffering. Because the thing is, fundamentally, it's going to be tough. There's, there's no job. There's no business. There's no venture. It's just pure enjoyment and fun. you got to put some work into it. And frankly, if it even a snippet of it is just pure fun, that often means that if you did put some work into it, you could be doing so much more, which the Pareto Principle is a great example of. But I, I love that, that example that you gave of just the way of working, because that's the way it should be. That's what's available to us and that's one of the reasons that i'm so driven to do this because the opportunity cost of not having life be like that and instead the situation that so many people are familiar with being worried about money being worried about even being able to retire which is time running out of time not being able to spend it with loved ones and doing loved activities it's a sad place to be and, and that's a place where i love meeting people to help them get out of that um but yeah, this is this is really, really key. Sorry, I got on a little bit of a, a passion tangent as well. But I guess that, that's what this is about, huh? Well, this, is, this is why you like helping people, right? Because you are passionate about it. Well, this is why I yeah. do what I do. So um, to wrap us up, what inspires you, Leo? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I guess it ties exactly into what I was just talking about. Um, I jumped the gun a bit, but it's that I, I've seen it. I, I, I've seen in so many ways, both being in a business, helping a business from the outside, and just with thousands and thousands of business owners that I've met, that transition. Um, many people I've been able to help them with that transition. Others that I've either just encountered or not worked with, I've just either seen them in one state or stay there, which is sad. But for me, it, it's helping more and more people make that switch from the situation I described earlier, where it's just not working. Because to start a business takes such a leap of faith and courage. Some people fall into it, but to really dive in and take ownership of it, that's tough. Because there are so many variables. There's so many things that can make it overwhelming. I mean, the brain can only comprehend about seven variables at one time. And the daily decision-making of a business owner or an intrapreneur which is just an entrepreneur within a business, it's far more than that. And the brain, because it wants to conserve energy, often just shuts down in that situation. It just says, you know what? It, it's not, I'm not gonna fight, I'm not gonna flight, I'm just gonna freeze. I'm gonna wait for this problem to go by. Um, so for me, what inspires me is meeting people in that situation where they're there and they're just waiting for something to pass by that frankly won't just on its own volition. Um, it'll result potentially in them closing the business or quitting, but they need to take action and they need to move forward and change their situation and figure out what are the vital tasks and figure out how they can multiply that input. And just like you said earlier, Danielle, see those little wins and build up momentum and really get their control back because once they do that and they start seeing that momentum and the biggest switch that I love in the beginning is realizing that this is the new standard. You know, it's like the, the way that things used to be and people describe it in so many different ways, but anybody in that situation will resonate with what I described, seeing that that's the thing of the past. 
and that it's a choice to stay where you are and to know and have the confidence in yourself that you'll continue to make the decisions to not only stay where you are, but consistently improve. Mm -hmm. That's what I live for. And there are some people that are in that mindset and they're really struggling for money. Um, and then there's some people, and this seems counterintuitive, but they're in that situation and they're definitely not struggling with money. They have businesses or jobs where they're doing really well, but they know how much better they could be doing. Sometimes it's multiplying income. Sometimes it's actually being able to take a vacation. Sometimes it's setting up a lifestyle so that you can have balance, which to many people seems like the price you pay for success. But I'd argue that success is balance and, and that's what it really leads to and that's actually what reinforces success but it's helping people see and empowering them to create that success for themselves and in turn inspire and help others do that for themselves that's that's why i do what i do yeah that sounds very rewarding mm -hmm. <laughs> all right so thank you so much for joining us leo if our audience wants to so find you how, how would they go about finding you great question so our website is runrightconsulting.com you can learn a little bit more about what we do we do complimentary sessions so if somebody is looking to find the right coach and it might be the right fit we can sit down to see if it makes sense on both ends uh, we'll run through a diagnostic process to see what they're struggling with where their business is limited or bottlenecked and then we'll talk about a, a plan to make that better because like i said earlier no business should really struggle due to lack of those resources we're here um, and something that's really important to me is to make sure that the business owners that we meet with they uh, get improved just by that session if we end up working together great if not we share some key tools from our program to help them out um, and they'll be on the path towards that success so they want to find us. Uh, that's our website. You can also Google me or um, the other coach, Crystal Shanks. Um, find our Yelp page. See over 120 success stories. Um, we can set up that conversation and uh, I'm excited for it. Yeah. And um, Smack Happy is one of those success stories, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You guys have, have done wonders for Smack Happy. Uh, we love you guys over here. All right. Well, I'd like to thank our audience for joining this Mac Happy Videocast. We aim to help your business through real life experiences and advice. Until next time. Oh, almost missed my cue. Until next time, everybody. Bye. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Smack Happy Design Videocast. For more information and downloads, visit smackhappy.com forward slash videocast, where you'll find more episodes and the opportunity to subscribe on YouTube or iTunes. You can also sign up for our newsletter delivered to your inbox monthly. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues. Again, that's smackhappy.com forward slash videocast. See you next time.